listening to the Wartime Leadership Podcast with your host, Nathan Coy. This month, more than a mastermind may. I'm your host, Nathan Coy, and today we are closing out the series I have called More Than a Mastermind May, where I've invited people on the show who I have the pleasure of speaking with on a regular basis. We invest into each other with the overall goal of personally developing into the best versions of ourselves. Now, today, folks, I've already had an amazing 30-minute conversation with today's guest because every time we start talking, it just continues on and on and on. And I'm always blessed because the man gives me a lot of time, a lot of time that's very valuable to a lot of people out in the world. Uh, he is the marketing genius behind Las Vegas's new motto, what happens here only happens here. Mr. John Mediana. Let's go. I feel like, man, I feel like I need to put those like boxing hoodie on with the gloves and like just come out here with the smoke and then the theme song goes you can't see me let's go oh man you can see me yeah but you i can actually i can see you and it's a beautiful thing john listen man every time that we get together and we start a conversation i'm always like man i need to record this and finally (laughs) finally i was able to connect with you to be able to record an episode yeah yeah i I mean there should be like a rule of thumb of like just always hit record period yeah just and that's it hmm. (laughs) why did i not think of this before (laughs) oh man sometimes it's like a muscle you got to build up you know like it's almost like for me it's like an automated kind of like uh you know not even a second thought it's just like by nature i just hit record just like boom it's just rolling if i gotta use it later cool if i don't cool (laughs) if i don't i don't if i do i don't why does it sound like ivan drago if he dies, he dies. <laughs> if he if he dies, he dies. <laughs> it's the Asian version of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, so, that's the hey, Filipino version. It's okay. My wife is Filipino. That's right. You, I know you what get a it pass. sounds like. You get a hard pass. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like Pacquiao. You know, every time yeah. she gets mad. Oof. <laughs> Oi. Why? Why don't you? Why don't you listen to me, huh? Oi. My son. Pacquiao. Huh? My my uncle Pacquiao. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> uncle is Pacquiao. Uh huh. Oh yeah. yeah uh, I could show yeah. you. I got. A, I got a. I got a practice glove of his that he he like punched into and then he mm. signed it. Pretty sure yeah. he like he like touched it once and then signed yeah. it and then sold like, it for like two hundred dollars. There you go, little one. Uh, <laughs> here, you be hey. your grandmother, huh? <laughs> Before we get going too far into this, I need to to start with five random questions. Let's go. From my random question generator. What is your favorite movie of all time? Oh, Hook. Hook. Okay, wasn't expecting that one. Why? why I know, right? It was weird. Oh, there's a story behind it. Okay. So the story (laughs) is like, Hook, that's super random. And that was super fast. What? The idea here is that when I was growing up, I was, you know, uh, me being Filipino, grew up in a Filipino home, right? My mom was a nurse, uh, just your typical, you know, nurse. Actually, she became a healthcare, uh, health um what's called health inspector and then my dad he got fired from a job when i was nine and then he started his own small business as a machine worker and growing up i didn't really have like all my relatives and cousins were like i'm gonna be a nurse i'm gonna be a lawyer i'm gonna be a doctor and i'm like that's not exciting to me (laughs) like what do i want to become i want to do something creative i want to write music i want to play like you know games sports all kinds of stuff i I was like i want to do everything except for the normal thing that we do Right. And then when I watched the film, I think it came out like 1992. I can't remember. Don't quote me. But when I saw that film, that masterpiece at the time, right, not only did I like recognize like, okay, like Peter Pan, like the whole story of that, you know, and like, I was like, oh, yeah, I never grow up, you know, the whole uh, use your imagination and all this stuff. The thing that resonated with me was none of that stuff. It was the fact that I saw a Filipino play Mm -hmm. a, a part, a role, a huge role in film. And it was Dante Bosco, my guy Rufio. And when I saw that, I said, we can do this. And that's what changed the trajectory of my career. And when I saw that someone like me can do this, that was mostly dominated in this industry by a certain group of people. 
I then, at that very moment, hope was instilled. And I was like, I'm going to, like, someone has to do it. Someone has to be behind the camera. Someone has to edit. Someone has to, and they make a living doing this. Mom. <laughs> right? Like, people do I this for really their jobs. I really make money, mom. Yeah. My whole career, I, you know, uh, today's about spiritual resilience and stuff. But, like, sometimes I tell people, I'm like, the, the reason why I have thick skin and I have a lot of resilience is because I grew up with an Asian mom. She, she cut me down my whole life. But I love her to death. But... She would cut you down in such an emotional way where it's like, oh, you don't really have a job. Like, why don't you just get like a regular job, huh? Just a normal job, like one job security, McDonald's, I don't care, whatever. It doesn't <laughs> have to be anything fancy, just, you know? Fancy. But like, you know, yeah. your job, your creative, that's like hobby, right? Like a weekend thing, huh? Like shoot weddings and stuff, like your cousin. No. <laughs> like, I had to grow up with that kind of thick skin. So, like, you know, the reason why I am the way I am and, like, the reason why I'm just, like, resilient the way I am is because of my Asian mom, I believe. Oh, 100%. And just, just you know, knowing, you know, obviously my wife's Filipino, so I know what it's like to grow up in a Filipino household. Like, like oh, to yeah. grow up to get married into it. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Yep. So and, so much, so many things that you, so many obstacles, gymnastics, mm-hmm. we call them, like, like emotional gymnastics that, that you got to kind of, like, navigate through because you don't know when a chunkle is coming. It's like, oh, chocolate here. (laughs) Dodge that one. (laughs) It's actually funny that you mentioned that because in San Antonio, where we were before Charleston, where we currently are, uh, that was the they they had a weekend where they would do all three baseball games with a (laughs) a name, and that was what it was was flying chocolates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a sport. It's a Olympic sport in the Philippines. (laughs) No kidding. Hey, if yeah. aliens came to Earth, would you be scared of them or would you welcome them? I would try to probe them. You know what I mean? They've been trying to probe <laughs> us for a long time. Like, why not? Why not reverse? <laughs> I want to. I want to show them. Probe like, for everyone. Listen, we're the alpha here, right? Of course, you flew across the galaxy. I don't care. But it's time for you all to get probed, right? I'm tired of this probing stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I would ask a lot of questions. I <laughs> and I think like you know especially being a believer you're like well i can't believe in aliens right I'm like Shit. well they, they talk about it in the bible i mean but they're like you know i think they're interdimensional more than extraterrestrial you know I, I think they're more like demonic than they are you know what we think they are um but i wouldn't mess around with them you know i'd probably send them all to a certain place in the in the states that i'm not going to name and i'll just send them all there um they, they could live in that island it's somewhere on the west coast. I, 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 I think I think everybody <laughs> listening understands uh, what you're saying, John. Secret uh, code. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, not so secretive. Just, uh, <laughs> just throw that one out there. Hey, are you yeah. one of those people that considers dates to be job interviews or or just a regular conversational? Date as in like expand. When you Maybe were date. dating when you were in your dating life where oh, yeah. maybe there was different Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't definitely. Know how to say I, I took I took the uh, job interview approach. Like, uh, if you could, if my wife was here, she would tell you I didn't really date in my twenty. I was building empires in my twenties. What was what they mm-hmm. would say, but I was failing at business over and over again. And trial and error in business in my twenties. I would launch a company. I would learn from that. I close it down. I uh, exited from a few companies, and then like that was all my time. I never actually had room to date. And if I did, it would be like, do they fit in my future, right? Like, where, are they qualified enough, right? <laughs> Who am I? Like, but I was like, you know what? Like, but that's the kind of swag I carried when I was in my twenties, right? Like, I was like, well, you're not, you know, I'm worth my time. Like, I'm gonna move on. Like, you know, because that's just we're just young, you know. But my wife, I've known her since 2007, so she was like, I've known her for a long time, and it's funny how <laughs> how we actually started dating because like. Uh, we rekindled our friendship and then we went on, I, I invited her to come to Hollywood to go check out some of our friends perform in Hollywood. And she never comes you know, like she, she was from San Diego and I, I was from LA. So like she would never come up from San Diego. I would always go down there. But when she came up, um, it was like the, the, the weekend of, cause this is like a week while we rekindled our friendship again. And I was like, there's some, there's like an on switch that went off. Cause I never saw her in a romantic way. Any, anything like that in the past ever vice versa she'd never seen me in, in that kind of way but this week that we spent together like something went 
like a, a switch had flipped and we're like okay god this is completely obvious what are mm. you doing here and then the way i asked her i was i told her i was like listen all right so at the end of the the date that we had like we went to go see my friends i was like listen i know what's going on and here's the thing we need to date each other and if we do date each other i will like i'm not trying to date without getting married so she had no choice <laughs> she'll tell you <laughs> she's like she, like she had no choice she's like okay like literally she's like all right okay then she went home that weekend and was like told her parents i was like i'm gonna marry john mediana like literally sat her parents down and said i'm gonna marry this man just because a week prior or two weeks prior she said i'm done with guys i'm done i'm over and then a week after that she wrote like we rekindle our our friendship that our friendship sparks into something where I'm just like, there's something about you. And then like, you know, and then I was like, listen, we got a date. Uh, you're not getting, you're not finding a way out of this. We're dating. And by the way, if we're going to date, we're going to get married. So your choice, make the smartest move. <laughs> it's, your, it's your choice. However, <laughs> however, if you do not do this, well, it, it will you will, fire. you will literally sleep every single night. In, in concern of regret and like what if and i don't want that for you you know what i mean so, i care i care enough about you not to do that to you i care i care about you enough to not let you like you know just just live with that regret so i'm gonna give you a choice but so that's that's my take on on dating is, is like you know yeah and who am i like obviously i love the relationship i love the friendship like we're best friends like you know and and we've had a great healthy just just um dating experience and and, and you know courting we still use the word courtship mm. courted her <laughs> and then um our engagement it was like we were dating for six months then we got engaged for six months and then we got married so like a full year wow and then to, to figure that out and then so just because when you know you know you know how long have you been married we are celebrating oh geez we're celebrating seven years in october so like it's about six and a half years now oh that's really awesome yeah yeah we got yeah. two kids two boys See, my, my wife and I, we dated, let's see, I, uh, she was in Saipan when I was in Guam. And Ooh. so I, after meeting her, after a month and a half, I asked her to marry me. Bold. 14 years it. later. Let's go, buddy. Boom. You're just Bring like, it. I just, I just see God in you. And well, I just, you I know, just know. The, the funny thing is you say that, but the. It was so true because yeah. I was sitting there 1, going, I'm 28 I'm years old. I'm not kidding. I'm 28 <laughs> years old whenever yeah. I got married, right? Like I, yeah. I was like, okay, God, great sense of humor. Send me to an <laughs> island that's 20 miles by eight miles. Mm -hmm. And then, and then show me, show me who my wife is. And then it's yep, like. And do your oh. thing. And then 14 years later, my <laughs> yeah. guy, like y'all still going strong, man. Absolutely. See, that's, that's, that's relationship goals. You know what I mean? Like, look, I, I'm not the one who's going to decide how God works. You know, especially with relationships. And, and here's the thing for all the single people out there. That life of singleness is going to go by so fast. And I know it feels like forever now. It mm. literally feels like eternity. But when done right, when it's God's way, it's going to feel like you just lived another life. And like this life ahead of you is going to be forever. Like, and it's amazing. And it's till death do us part. And it's like you have this partner in Christ in, in, in the kingdom, whether, you know, you believe it or not. Like it is a spiritual, just you know, uh, covenant that happens, and it's special, and it's 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 set apart, and when that happens, you're gonna feel like time has just begun, you know. And like I remember being single, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm cursed with a gift of singleness, and like, <laughs> you know, and you're just like waiting forever. But the thing is, and you're you're asking yourself like, why did I spend so much time dwelling on? just a single life and, and for me like i have to recognize that early on like i'm, I'm not gonna I, I always told myself too and i always told people this too especially even my wife I, and she heard me say this while i was in my singleness like hey like you know this is a sing season where it's not gonna be like this forever in my life it's a season so i'm gonna accept it as a season do what i'm called to do and what my assignment is in the season and then move yeah. on to the next season and if that season is marriage that's gonna be an exciting journey for mm -hmm. me but more so for my wife because you know She's going to be like, I married a good one. No. <laughs> I married no, a great kidding. one. I married completely out of my league, by the way. <laughs> like, if you saw, if you throw up a picture of my wife, you would be like, my gosh, you, you, I don't know, man. You have the favor of God on you. 
because <laughs> you're married way up. <laughs> so that's how I feel. Oh, no, I know. I know that feeling. Hey, usually, I mean, hey, these these random questions have actually started to do really, really great things for me because they have driven so much great conversation oh, yeah. out of it. And I yeah. love the fact that you brought up, you know, your wife in the background. Speaking yeah. of your background, brother, yeah. why don't you take us through yours? Take us through right. your journey and, and what brought you to, to here and now. Yeah, man. I mean, see, um, let me start. When two people fall in love, man, they just, no, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> but uh, my story begins um, very, in a very unique way. Um, so I said, I had mentioned that I'm Filipino, that I grew up in a Filipino home. The only, the thing that I did leave out was the fact that I was adopted. And I was adopted, um, being a Filipino, into a Filipino family. And I didn't find out I was adopted until I was eight years old. And I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were both deacons, like they were serving in church. And I just always remembered going to church ever since I could possibly ever remember, right? Like since I had my first memory, I was like, oh yeah, church is a thing. And we're there all day, every day. So like I always went to church. They were always serving in church. We always had people at our house all the time. And it was just like, they had this generous lifestyle of like opening like the doors and just accepting anybody and everybody. And I grew up in this and I saw like how they treated people, how much they love people. And then like, I found out I was adopted when I was eight years old. My cousin, actually, we were at a family uh, gathering and um, she she walks in, barges in the room. And I was, I was watching Nickelodeon or something like that. And at this family thing, she goes like, John, like, hey, you're adopted. And I was like, oh, what? Excuse me? And she just out of nowhere, out of nowhere, completely out of nowhere, super random. Like, John, you're adopted. I was like, excuse me? I'm just sitting here trying to enjoy TV. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? I'm literally watching somebody get slimed right now. Like, yeah, I'm like, dude, so, someone's getting slimed. She's like, I had to tell you because your sister's here. And I said, who? I don't have a sister. I thought I grew up in a, in a, I was the only child growing up. I was like, I don't have a sister. She's like, yeah, you do have a sister. She's adopted as well. She's an adopted person, sister. But she... She got married and had kids of her own, so she was, like, a lot older. So, like, I didn't really get to see her, right? So I don't really remember her growing up. And the first memory I have is, is of my cousin telling me that I was adopted, then follow up with, like, yeah, your sister's here. And I'm like, what sister? And so after that, fast forward, it didn't really mess with me until my teen years, like, until I started having more questions. Like, like okay, if I'm adopted, that means that, you know, someone, two people had to give me up, right? So they're either like in my head growing up, I was like, okay, they're either, you know, drug addicts or they're from a different planet. Cause I was super into comic books at the time, like Superman and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm from Krypton. I'm from Krypton. Right. I, I'm, I'm a suit. I'm, oh my gosh. Like I'm going to go lift stuff. a car off of somebody Dude, right now. I took, I took Taekwondo. I took, I was like jumping off of uh, like brick walls and like, I'm going to fly. I, I promise you I'm, I wore capes. I used to make my own costumes every, every year for Halloween with my buds. And, like, I literally was, like, I'm so fascinated by, like, nerdy, just superhero stuff because I always felt like I resonated with them. Mm -hmm. Like, there were, some, there were always some outcasts. There were always something different about them. They always lived, like, kind of like a secret. I kind of felt like my life was kept a secret, by the way. Like, like, I asked my parents when I confronted them. I was like, hey, so who's my parents? Like, where do I come from? And they're like, you know, just in their Filipino way or their Asian way. And if you don't know this or understand this, understand this about Filipinos. They're very secretive. So they're like... We're not going to tell you until you graduate from college. <laughs> like, is this like, bribing me to is, finish you're, college? You're, you're, you're bribing me to finish college and you're just being the worst right now. <laughs> like, so like, but that, they held that true. Like they, they literally never told me and not even when I was a teenager and I was struggling. And the thing was like, I was going to church and I saw like, the ins and out of church and the church politics and all kinds of stuff that happened in church. And I was at a distance enough where it's like, okay, I, I, I get that there is this God. You know, I, I kind of felt like uh, in my teen years, I was just very agnostic, I guess. Like, yeah, there's a God, but he didn't, really doesn't want anything to do with me. Like, I'm just gonna, the only thing that really kept me alive and hopeful was creativity. And I'm just being completely transparent. I, I attempted suicide three times when I was 15 and 16. And I, I was, um, I was writing music. I, I, I got introduced to, to music through worship and, and also skateboarding, punk rock and hip hop growing up in LA. 
right, in the 90s and early 2000s. And I picked up my first camera when I was very young, never put it down because it was always an outlet. I paused time for a split second and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Right? I learned how to create film in the dark room and like process film and all that stuff when I was like mm-hmm. 11 years old. And I feel like some of that stuff is, has entered my brain and I have like lower brain cell counts. <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like a dumb person, you know, like, but I'm like creative dumb. So it's just like everything has to be super simple and easy to process or else it doesn't make sense. So like, I feel like, you know, my time in the dark room, my time writing music, my time always being in the band, always feeling like there's a creative outlet kind of gave me hope. Like that was the thing that actually kept me alive because I had this, this kind of like, almost like, like this, this disproportion, um, disadvantage, you know, of like, look, you're not actually supposed to be here, John. Like, you know, like that's how I felt with my cousins and, and people in life, like, you know, like, John, you're not actually supposed to be here, actually. Like, you're kind of like a mistake. Like, they never said this, but this is what I felt, you know? Like, hey, you're actually a whoops. Like, wow. and you're you're a burden to the ones that adopted you, right? Because you're just getting into... And I never partied. I never drank or nothing like that. Nothing crazy. But I did play loud music till, like, 2 or 3 in the morning. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's a little something. But, you know, and I, I, I struggled with identity and value and um, what it meant to be a human. And uh, I, I then was so deep and, and so lost, you know, um, at 18, I, I hit rock bottom on my life. I, again, I never partied, never drank, but I did want to end my life just because of the sole purpose of, of, of not having purpose. And feeling like, well, the world would go around anyways. Why should, like, why was I born, right? And then that amazing, miraculous moment when I was by myself, my parents were on vacation, like my friends were away. I was at my house alone. And at this moment, hitting rock bottom, I was like, all right, I don't know what to do with my life. I've kind of come to the end of my rope in my own power. I felt my home be filled with the Holy Spirit. And... It was such a vivid and physical feeling that I felt like this warm oil from the head, top of my head to the sole of my feet. And I was by myself. I got down on my knees and I was bawling my eyes out, like just bawling my eyes out. And I I felt, and I didn't hear audibly, but I felt with every fiber of my being, just the words spoken over me. And the first word was John, like Jonathan, John, I'm calling you by name. The second thing that followed up with that was, I love you. And I knew what you've, I've known what you've been through and it wasn't easy, but I still got a plan for you, said this word. And wow, I was blown away. I was in tears. And I say, God, if this is you, I've done a great job of ruining my life. I mean, I didn't do any drugs, but I felt like, wow, like there's nothing good coming out of my life. I had made a promise. I said, God, if anything good comes out of my life from here on out, it is because of your grace, your mercy, and your love. And in that moment, I said, I, I, I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I accept Jesus in my heart. I got up, and my drummer from my band knocked on the door. And I didn't even think he, was, I, he knew I was home. He was like, hey, I just felt like I needed to come and pray for you, man. He's not even a, like, he's not even a, like, really a believer. Like, he didn't really go to church or nothing like that. He was just like, dude, it's weird. I kind of just had this feeling of coming over mm-hmm. and praying for you, man. And I was like, that's weird because you'd never asked to do that ever. <laughs> like, we're just like rocking in a van, you know? And then, so he prayed for me and I was like, I need to get plugged into a church, you know? I just need to get plugged in because that's the only thing I knew, right? And I was like, look, I need to, I need to get plugged in to, um, and, and whatever it is that I thought of, like, we can adopt it. I thought it was like a burden and all this stuff. And in fact, when I started reading the Bible more, I realized that being adopted is actually typical. And it's such a powerful thing because, God had to choose us. And when you have your own kids, like I have my own kids, right? Uh, you don't necessarily get to choose that child every day. Like, you know, I still absolutely love them because they're mine, right? They're my legacy. They're everything. I love them. But when you adopt a, a child, you have to make a, a very thought, thoughtful choice every single day to choose that child, to love that child every single day, every single moment, no matter what. And that's what, how God saw us. 
And that's exactly how God saw me. So being adopted actually showed me a dimension of God that I'd never really saw before. That showed me, it showed me a new side of Jesus. And that was a miraculous moment for me where I said, I don't care where I've come from or who, like at that moment, I still didn't know who my parents were at 18. And I said, I don't care who my parents are anymore. I know who my father is and I know where I come from and I know what my mission and purpose is. And it is to show God's goodness and share that goodness and love with everybody I encounter using the gifts and skills that he's given me of storytelling, of, of whatever it is that I've accumulated up until this point. And the thing is, I'm going to continue to get better tomorrow and the day after that, the day after that, I'm going to get better at storytelling. I'm going to get better at becoming whatever he put inside of me. It's coming out. It's going to come out force with a force, right? So at that moment, from 18 beyond, every opportunity I saw as a favor from God, and I said, God, thank you for providing me with this opportunity to work with celebrities, to work with LL Cool J, to work with Capitol Records, to work with Jessica Simpson, to work with, you know, Jane's Addiction, all these people that are influential in the space, and to launch YouTube channels, to launch, you know, uh, social media campaigns all over, to work from the bottom all the way up and, and him providing every single opportunity to the table just because I decided to say yes and anything good that comes out of me is because he's it, that he's good and he's faithful. And at one point when I thought I wanted to end my life, he gave me new life and he restored everything and, and multiplied every gift, every talent, every network, every connection I ever made. And he made them fruitful. He introduced me to people and I was in rooms and spaces I've never thought I've ever been or ever be in because of God's grace, and he's that good. So in my 20s, I was able to build businesses, close them down, learn from the failures, learn from mistakes, learn about marketing on a ground level, right? And learn about design, purpose. I love design and I love purpose because there's every, to every design, there's a purpose and a reason for things designed, right? That's why I'm so fascinated by like things like iPhones and, and the way psychologically they're designed and the way social media is psychologically designed for you to to keep on scrolling and those dopamine hits, obviously you could either use it for good or use it for evil. It's an agnostic tool. These are agnostic technologies. But if you can grasp the, the complete purpose of what you can use this tool for to give life and meaning and amplify the good because the evil in the world sleeps none. They don't sleep. If good people could just grasp the power and tools that, that is out there and continue to do good, then good will prevail. But it's because no one speaks up. So, and so no one what is that tools. what is that like being in a room like like you've been in the room with Gary V. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and and worked in that type of what what is that like in that that moment where you know that you're you're sent in there with this purpose? Mm -hmm. of of who you are yeah. that sent you in there what's that like being in those rooms next to next to those people yeah um so you you brought up gary v 2016 you know i was working with um i was launching a youtube channel called video influencers with my buds and i was doing a lot of their their video content sean cannell benji travis they launched a lot a few things think media is one of them and they wrote the book youtube secrets which i'm going to talk about like one of my books that i want people to read is youtube secrets go look for it you know um, but I was sitting in the room with Gary Vee because he invited us because he just launched his book, Jab, 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 Right Hook. And I've been a Gary Vee fan since 2013, 12 or 13, because I read his book, Crush It. And his book, Crush It, resonated with me. That's the other book. Um, because I wanted to pursue entrepreneurship, but I didn't have a game plan because all my game plans had to revolve around becoming a nurse or getting a degree or going to work, working for the DMV or something like that, you know? So I read Crush It and I was like, this blew my mind because there's other people like me that think like me. And when you're filled with purpose and you understand like you're on a mission, you know, and God's giving you an assignment and you're sitting in the room. And when I was there in 2016 at his office in New York, it was like an aha moment for me where I was like, oh, this guy's a human being. And the greatest compliment I think I've ever received was when he looked at I was, I had like five cameras on him and like, I literally had like three vlog cameras, two other cameras, one, like I had a whole setup, one person, me, I was the only video guy and I had two recording mics and all this other stuff. He looked at me, he's like, 
dude, you're running five cameras? I was like, yeah. He goes like, D-Rock, yo, man, you're slacking, right? So like, he, like because of the excellence I was living and because of the skills that I developed, and I was like, yo, I can create a video that looks like it was produced by a team of 15, and it was just me. That demonstrated God's glory, like God's favor and, and recognition. And from there, we built a relationship. I built a relationship with Vader Media. And whenever he travels around and I'm like in the vicinity, like they call me up. They're like, John, we need, we need you to do photos. We need you to do video. Blah, blah, blah. When I was in Vegas, right, they were calling me, do photos. You know, uh, Gary Vee's doing a private event. It's a two-day event. Like just be there, hang out, take photos, whatever. Right? And then I'm working with some of his clients and all that stuff because it's a trusted source. It's like, dude, like, you know, it's like your network is your net worth. You know, that's a true saying. So when I was sitting there and I was like, oh, God, I got all this purpose. And I, I wanted to, blah, 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 like, I wanted to just tell him, like, hey, man. But I, I know that it's like, hey, like, God's timing and recognition. He's going to open up an opportunity. And, like, his opportunity was like, yo, this guy is killing it. Like, he's got five cameras. He's doing his thing. And it's just one person. And that sparked, like, a, awareness or attention, you know. And then that created the relationship that we have today. and. It was because I, w I was just doing the thing that God called me to do and be great at. And it was nothing more than that. And I was like, hey, just be in your lane and do what you do best. And that's all I heard. You don't got to say something. You don't got to, like, give them a nothing. You, you, I didn't even, even want to say a word. I was just like, I'm here to do a job because I'm, I was a professional. I'm professional at what I do. I show up, do the work. You know, that's what my hat says, do the work. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also the, the, the rest of this quote is do the work that God has put before you to do, right? Nice. Don't get that out of context. So, because he goes before you, above you, below you, behind you. You know what I mean? So um, the idea was do what you do best, John, and I'll take care of the rest. And if I could t continue to do that, because one thing I, I realized about being a great artist is, is good artists will go around and tell people how great, like how good their work is. That's a good artist. And they should. They should market all the time. A great artist will always be told how great their work is because they just do the work because it's the practice of it. And if you continue to practice and practice and practice, I don't need a billboard. I don't need a compliment. I don't need a patent back because I'm mastering the art of practitionership. Yeah, I think, I think everybody tries to turn and make their own value of yeah. themselves and the value of what they think. Yeah. they're good at when in reality it's those given traits and and you're right sometimes it means just sitting in a room and not saying anything at all yeah and just to let that's the it. process happen that's so, exactly right yeah and, and it can be hard especially when we talk about leadership to to do that because it's hard to as a leader let somebody else shine sometimes mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that, that can be difficult as a leader to see the next generation yeah. coming in, which we're supposed to be creating. So what's that look like for you? I mean, from the yeah. the, the team of two going into Gary V's office to you now having a, a, a Multi -creative very creative agency. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, the process is, is uh, has been quite a journey and I'm still in that process. I think I learned a lot in church. So like I went back to church and I became a, a youth leader after I got saved. That weekend, I remember it was a Thursday, and that weekend I went to church, friend's church, and I was like, I need to be a youth leader. I, I, I don't want anyone that was 15 or 16 go through the things I went through without having a mentor, right? So I went back in, I served, and I did internship, and, and like, I noticed I had my feet in two worlds, yeah? So like, one was in the industry world where I was like doing work and getting paid. The other was in the church world where I was mentoring and, and getting mentored and just like sharpening as a leader. You know, in both worlds, I, I was very blessed to have both experiences. And in that, I've learned, you know, how to build teams and how to delegate. Because those things are, like, I'm just going to be completely honest as a creative. I, my mind is all over the place. And uh, it took me a long time and still continuing to take me a long time. Not, like, as long, but to have the discipline to delegate, see a vision and create a plan, a path of action and creating a process and system to get the stuff done. That's the stuff I had to learn, you know, building an agency and, and coming from the agency world. Like I had to, first of all, see how it's done. So I saw the church model and how they delegate in leadership and how that works. And I got to see 
the agency world too. Uh, you had mentioned, you know, rebranding Las Vegas and all that stuff, working with a, a really well-known agency, the agency that came up with a campaign in 2001, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? That was the, that was the agency that I was a part of. And uh, my whole task was to rebrand and recreate a new content strategy and a rebrand that was going to launch in 2020 during the pandemic. And we successfully did that during the pandemic. And then we had to pivot. Um, but that I had to watch how a large agency delegates leadership and how they they delegate it from the top down. And I saw how bad leaders work and I saw how good leaders work. Just being in the church world uh, became my, my growth in the church world was was evolving you know, into almost, uh, actually it became creative director roles in mega churches, a few mega churches in the past, and then learning how to delegate and, and also be, you know, very intentional about leadership in that role. So I took that, brought that in the industry world, brought the things in the industry world into the church world. So I kind of like mix, mix matched the two. And I was like, I'm learning from here. I'm learning for there. And like, you're just getting this, you know, this kind of like makeshift kind of thing, but it's what helped me define how to run an agency today. You know, we have uh, a team of, of, of over, over a dozen creatives that we manage and a sales team and, and a process and systems and we work with clients all over the world that are creating impact in the world that are multi-million dollar figure companies, you know, they're in charge of. So it's like mind blowing that, that God would take someone that was going to end their life and then flip it and turn it and, and create good out of it. You know, when I look back in my life, I'm like, how, how God, like, not just like why God, I understand his goodness and stuff, but like how, how did you do this, right? How did you take this, this black sheep of a Filipino that doesn't, wasn't supposed to be here, right? And then create good and stories that people watch and are moved. I remember just the, the sheer reward of creating fil films and music videos. Like one of the first music videos I directed was um, for A21 campaign, which was helping um, sex trafficking, right? Was helping uh remove women from that industry and and saving them and i remember it was a seven day film shoot we had zero budget because it was all nonprofit, and it was a it was a beautiful thing because i understood i was like wow when someone watches this they'll get the impact of the story and there's just tears on the other side and when you watch someone watching your stuff and you're like i just dreamt of this vision and it came to life and we made it together and it was a cohesive collaborative you know, experience and creativity, and it is impacting and drawing massive attention to this thing that is so just demonic, you know, but is bringing good things and bringing curiosity and bringing awareness to it. And you just see people in tears because you have no idea how they're connected to it in that world and how much it's transforming their life. I'm sitting back and I'm just, I don't still think about it. I still get moved. I'm like, oh my gosh, like God, you gave me this opportunity, this tool to tell stories and to present them in a way where people could digest it and accept it. You know, that's why I love what our friend Eric is doing. The Kingdom Warriors, man. Mm -hmm. like, it's just oh, yeah. insane, right? But like the creative is leading the culture because they're not afraid to take risks when it comes to vision. You know what I mean? And I believe everyone's designed to be creative. I don't care if you're type A or type Z. I don't care. In your own right, you're designed to be creative in the way you organize folders. And the way you work your way around Excel, like that's so creative, man. You know? But, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Hey, so I've I've followed you now on Instagram, on yeah. on Twitter. I've I've seen how you interact, and and I knew that you were a believer. Yeah. But the way that you come across on social media, it's you're not preaching at people. You're not you're not talking down. You're 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 not doing anything to disparage a relationship right and what and but you know at the same time you know you're you're not shoving it down people's throats of here's here's what i believe here's who i yeah. am as a person you're you're creating a relationship in a lot of those times how do you define spiritual resilience in that yeah uh, i think well number one um, thanks for following. Um, that boosts my morale. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thanks for the views. No. Um, number one is my approach to social media and sharing the gospel is the way that that Jesus found me. He didn't push it. He didn't shove it down my throat. He met me where I was at, on my knees, looking for answers without purpose, without meaning. And 
the way I present myself to people online, that's the first defense, right? That's the first line of, of, of awareness is the stuff that people find about you. And I, I, I intentionally make it so that I'm almost like, uh, uh, almost what's disarming approach. I, I, I believe in such a disarming approach because that's the way Jesus approached me. It wasn't, it wasn't feeling like guilt or shame or judge, judgment. I didn't feel any of that. I felt acceptance, relatability. I felt I, I was seen, I was heard, I was understood. But I was also called to change and transform when I got in proximity. So the things that people see of me online in this resilience, I guess, like, you know, is the fact that I don't want to see the way, I want to see people the way that Jesus saw me in that moment. And I will continuously obey because that, that is the thing that was like, all right, I can't, I can't tout and say how awesome and how much I love Jesus. Cause there's moments where I'm just like, God, why, why did you choose this? Like when me and my wife and I, she'll, she'll give me permission to say this story is that when we went through three miscarriages, you know, in, in like the two year span that we went through and I was like, literally like, forget you, God. Like, I don't want nothing to do with you, man. Like, I can't believe you're, you're like, we're going through this devastation, you know? And it was heartbreaking. My wife had to go through surgeries, you know? If ectopic present pregnancies, she had to get surgery. And he wasn't threatened by that. He was like, yeah, I get it. I'm with you. Man, I'm hurting too. I'm hurting for you. Right. So my approach to this resilient, especially in today's world, is not to just come out the gates and swing at people. Meet people with the way that you were met when you when Jesus first approached you and said, Hey, child, I love you. And I want you to be closer to me. And I want to create proximity. And when you do, your life is just gonna transform. It's gonna look a little different. And I need you to be okay with that. Because I ain't gonna leave you the same you were as you were. Right. So like when we jump on a call, like you see me online, you're like, dude, psh, this guy's dropping this. But when we get on a call, when the when the recording's off and we're just having a conversation, man, that's where ministry happens, right? That, yeah. That's where like we share our war stories. We're like, man, my brother in Christ, like iron sharpens iron. When we're in the more than a mastermind group and a lot of people hear my story for the first time or you know, we just get, they're like, I didn't know John spoke like this. I didn't know he didn't have this kind of, right? But I'm like, hey, if you get to know me in five seconds and we're just face to face, you know, you might have wanted to come on the call because you saw that stuff on social media. But once you're on the call, you're like, man, this dude, I, he has more, like, I have more respect for this guy. I got more, you know, like he just has more clout in my brain and my mind just because he's so willing to be vulnerable and transparent. And like, I got nothing to hide, you know? So when people ask me that are not believers, they're like, where'd you get this from? I'm like, well, let me just tell you, I'm gonna say it is, it's all God. I can't even front. I can't even pretend like it was me. I can't pretend like it was me that set up the whole Gary Vee thing and set up all these celebrities and set up all this stuff because at my, in my pace, I was gonna end my life. My life would be completely over and I would not exist if it wasn't for the grace of God. So I don't get any credit. I'm going to boast about his love for me and not my love for him because I love him so much. There's sometimes I love tacos. More. <laughs> you know what I mean? Taco yeah, Tuesdays. No, let's I go. But you know what I mean? Boast about how much he loves us and no, we'll I, find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. I get it. Spiritual resiliency. I, I, you know, this whole journey began with a simple question. Yeah. How do you define it? Right. Like that's yeah. that's what started this whole podcast was just to, to help people identify different ways of which to identify spiritual resiliency in their own lives. Yeah. And I think it, it does, you know, when, when you talk to a faith based individual who's a Christian, who's a believer, it almost always comes back to vulnerability and transparency. Yeah because that's that's how christ lived like he was vulnerable i mean he was human just like you and i are sitting here talking yeah. he was talking to other people he just did it differently yep and this whole campaign <laughs> i love this campaign that that's going around these that you know the super bowl i think aired like four different commercials 
that Jesus uh, Revolution. When he gets us, yeah. Yeah, 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 he got, yeah man, he gets us, man. Uh, it's, it's so true. I think um, <laughs> I come from the marketing world, right? So like, I watch a lot of campaigns, and I, I'm like, I for some reason I go straight to the, I see their angle, you know, like because I've been in it so, for so long, like I could be like, oh, they just want me to do something, but like. When you have a real authentic campaign, that's like it really shakes you up, and you're like, it makes you. I love a campaign that reframes your thinking, right? Not just some like clever, you know, clickbait kind of opportunity, right? Something that actually makes you think and reframe. That's a powerful campaign. That is, that's not marketing. That's human marketing. That that's human to human speaking directly to the soul and saying this is why you should care and that type of marketing is the most powerful type that i've witnessed throughout i've probably seen like two or three of those in my lifetime when it comes to marketing that's just so powerful yeah so this when, is one of them when, when i think of that I, I i always think of that one super bowl commercial where they had the the guy running down the aisle you know kind of set like big brother and mm -hmm. running down the aisle with the with the sledgehammer and then throws it, you know, what it was an Apple commercial. It was an Apple commercial. Yeah. Actually, that's the most famous Apple commercial. They took a risk on that because they took a that was a she was a part of the Olympics, and it was it was a, a athletic campaign where it was like smash the norm. It was like smash the uh, status quo, right? Basically, yeah. and um that that was one of the marketing campaigns that I was bringing up to mind is is there's there's there is there is storytelling that has shaped. A future and direction like uh, we call it impact marketing because when you are in when you're encountered with this piece of content it changes the trajectory of how you think from now and beyond right and from now and, and like well i just really whenever i think of uh, uh something like that i'm always going to think of that one brand or that one thing that is the power of storytelling. And this is what Jesus was so great at. He is the greatest chief marketing officer I ever met, like I ever read in my life. You know what I mean? Like, cause he knew I'm how kidding. to tell stories. Mm -hmm. He knew how to connect to the soul. He knew how to speak people's language. And he, he didn't, he wasn't afraid to get dirty. He wasn't afraid to, to, to be in your face. He wasn't afraid to flip tables. You know, he, he wasn't. And, and he was bold and he was, he was, you know, and he didn't leave you the same. That's the yeah. thing. You know what I mean? So he was the ultimate impact creator, right? When you encounter Jesus, your whole life would change, period. Now, in, in keeping with that, how do you um, how do you build up spiritual resiliency within your own life? Like, what do you do on a daily to, to, to build that up in yourself as well as your team? Yeah, number one, you, you have got to create proximity with Jesus, intentional proximity with Jesus because you could check off, oh, did I do a Devo today? Which by the way, I'm not against, like I love Devos. I'm doing one right now, you know, spiritual entrepreneurship, right? I think it was by uh, John, um, I forgot who was the author, but we're doing it. And so number one, you need proximity as a, as a human being to the source of life and that is Jesus. Read the red letters, right? Be in proximity, sit at the feet of Jesus. Number two, you need to be surrounded by, by people that will help mold and shape the lens that you look through life, right? So hopefully they're believers. And hopefully if you're in business as an entrepreneur and you want to go that direction, be in those circles and be in those camps. Understand that these people are, are they're sharpen you and, and, and mentor you and help you and, and be completely vulnerable with. You need to have that brotherhood, sisterhood, right? But whoever's listening, you need it. You need people in your life that's going to help do life with you, right? Because if you're able to do that, you're, you're able to, to keep on track on the mission, right? And the mission's like, what assignment are you on? What's your purpose? What's your vision? What do you want to see? What do you want to see happen this year? What do you want to see happen this month? What do you want to see happen today, right? And then you, you're on the mission. What mission are you on? What assignment are you on right now? Because everybody's on assignment. You just don't know it yet. Is your assignment to be at the nine to five and, and provide for your family? That's an assignment. But also, how do you in, how do you put Jesus in the center of that? Be like, all right, every opportunity I see is, is going to be a divine opportunity. And, and I need to have the eyes to see the opportunity that God's providing in, in front of me. 
And lastly, like when I think about spiritual resiliency is I, I think per, about perspective. Perspective is huge. Now, okay, John, perspective. Give me some perspective. Okay, let's give some science. I love science. Let's give some science. All right. And you probably heard Gary V talk about this, but this is very scientific, right? Lots of studies. One out of 400 trillion. I just need someone to write that down, somebody. One out of 400 trillion, right? One out of 400 trillion is the likelihood, chance of you being alive right now, 2023. This has to calculate your parents ever meeting and falling in love, their grandparents meeting and falling in love, their parents being in different countries meeting, falling in love. And the, like, if you rewind the tape all the way back to like Adam and Eve in the very beginning of the world and the universe and whatever you want to believe in, right? One out of 400 trillion. Okay, so those numbers are pretty vague. Well, let's put it into perspective. If I took a football stadium, let's just say like the average football stadium, 72,000 seats, right? 72,000 seats. 50 to 72,000 seats. And each seat is filled with a human being, okay? Now, let's multiply that and have 50 football stadiums. Okay, so imagine in your mind, if you close your eyes, 72,000 people sitting in a football stadium, multiply that by 50 stadiums. That's a lot of people. Now give each person a trillion-sided dice. Okay, so you saw the person sitting in the seat, 72,000 multiplied by 50,000 stadiums. Each person in the 50,000 stadiums sitting in the 72,000 seats in each stadium is holding a one trillion sided dice. What does that even look like? A lot. Okay. Now, the chances of you existing today, you breathing, me, you, Nate, here, 2023, being on this call in Riverside, having a podcast moment that's being recorded, imagine that each person rolled that dice that they hold, 50 stadiums, 72,000 seats, and every single dice landed on the same number. That is, wow. the, percent, that is the chance of you being born the time that you're supposed to be born right now. If you're listening to this podcast, this is, your, this is the chance of life in the whole entire universe, in the billions and billions of galaxies and stars, that life on this planet, in this very moment that we're breathing, that you could hear my voice, this is every single dice landing on the same number. That is the chance of you having breath in your lungs right now. So when I say perspective, you need to have perspective in your life that this little dash in between the day you were born and the day you die has purpose and meaning for eternity. And you're getting so caught up on the dude that got your Starbucks order wrong. You're so caught up because you don't know where bills are going to come from, you're, the money to pay that. You're so caught up because you, you can't get 1,300 likes on your profile photo. You're so caught up because no, no one's sharing your content. You're so caught up because perspective, okay? Perspective. You're born to be in proximity with the creator of the universe and born to do great things because he's already done the work ahead of you that you need to walk into, and that's your assignment. Perspective. Having the boldness and courage to say, God, look, man, I don't know what my life is leading to, but I trust you. And I know you got good things for me. And even if you don't have good things for me, I should obey because you're the creator of the universe and you created me. And I know that the reward of, doing, of being obedient is, is bigger than the sacrifice of, of, you know, maybe not eating out once or twice a, a week. Perspective. That's it. The greatest creator of all time. That he Absolutely. is. Absolutely. That he is. I don't know. Spiritual resilience. I know that's a long answer to a short question. Oh, no. That, that is the most beautiful answer that I've received to the simplest question. So, uh, you mentioned two books 
what yeah. were those two books again that that you you would say would be your uh, add to my library? I mean, there's a few. I would I would start with um if you're an entrepreneur and you want to pursue something and you're like, man, I'm really stuck and I'm trying to get unstuck in my life. Crush it was the first book I read from Gary Vee. It was the first book I think he wrote, and it, it helped propel me to to get out of my stinking thinking when it comes to can I do this? Is this what I'm designed to do? Like, and he's not even a Christian, right? Like, he's just an entrepreneur that happens to you know, inspire many people. So crush it. And then my friend wrote a book called YouTube Secrets. And this is to get more um, awareness. Like YouTube is a search engine. So if you want to get really tactical and make money um, online with your business, you know, like in and crush it on YouTube, go check out YouTube Secrets. Um, phenomenal book. You can get it on Amazon. But if we're talking about like leadership stuff, obviously like John Maxwell is the GOAT. So like we're, we're talking about the leadership book already. Uh, obviously it's on your list. You know, but I think um, if anything, if I wanted to, to push a book out there, I would say um, Forgotten God by Francis Chan. Um, phenomenal book. Forgotten God is all about the Holy Spirit. And uh, I can't do anything without him. You know, I, I can't recollect or recall any moments without the Holy Spirit reminding me right, of those moments. Man, and, Francis Chan has such an amazing way of... I, not dumbing down stuff, but putting it at a at a at an understandable level for anyone. He's one of the most brilliant communicators of our time, and I believe that you know the way he simplifies such a complicated message, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and he dumb, not dumbs it down, but he makes it known like to the common person. And he yeah. said, "This is how God. This is what God king, God's kingdom's like. You know, this is what the Holy Spirit's like." So I would say, "Forgotten God" really transformed my walk with um with the holy spirit and and how he functions so check those out all right hey any final words that you have for the listeners yeah um i mean one thing i think that i struggled with forever is um you have everything you need you don't need if you're looking for permission you got permission yeah. you are adopted into the kingdom of God. You are a son and daughter of the high king. And it would be funny if I had to go to, if I went to my dad's house and I had to ask him for things, like to get something from the fridge, dad, dad, can I please get something from the fridge? He'll kind of laugh at me and be like, walk through the bridge and open the door. It's whatever you want, son. Right? Like, because it's also yours. So you have everything that you need. And you can ask God for clarity, for meaning, for whatever it is that you're asking him for. And it's not like some genie or nothing. Like, like God, you could even say, God, teach me how to pray. I don't know how to pray, man. Teach me how to pray. Show me how to pray. And guess what? He's going to fill you with wisdom. He's going to teach you how to pray. And you have everything you need and you, don't, you, you have permission. You have permission to fail. You have permission to grow. You have permission to, to, you have grace, right? Give yourself permission. You have it and you have everything you need. Start doing something with it. Don't start looking around like you need it from someone else or you need validation for someone else or permission for someone else or you don't, you don't need that stuff. You got everything that you need because you're, you're made in the image of God and you got the Holy Spirit. Go, go and do the thing. Go do the work. Um, now I hope that you all have a better idea of why these more than a masterminds and why these, the investment of others into your life is so important. It's for these types of moments. This, this is what I get to listen to every single Thursday from these five individuals that we've had through the month of May, uh, to invest into you. This is just one hour that you get with them. But I, I have the pleasure and honor of being able to sit down and professionally develop but more importantly, personally develop with each of these individuals. It's It's been a true blessing. Thank you, John, for Thank investing you. into us today because it huge blessings. Yeah, thanks blessings. for having me on. This is such, this is so fun. Oh yeah. And every single time that you and I get together, it's always a conversation <laughs> like this. And yeah. I love it. I'm, and I'm going yeah. to now start recording it from here on out. So <laughs> there's that. You have permission to always hit record. Yes. Hey, today's episode is only possible thanks to my friend and producer, G. Frazier, with 369sounddesign.com. He is truly the one with the hardest job, John, because he has to try to make you and me 
oh, sound really, really great. And he does it great time after time after time. We are blessed by the entire team here at the Wartime Leadership Podcast. See you next time. Be blessed.